Welcome to today's session, Caring for Your Voice, Maintaining Vocal Health for Teaching. Uh, we're really glad that you're here. I know this is a topic that has been uh, probably at the forefront of many of our minds as we got started this semester. We know it's difficult to speak, particularly for an extended period of time and in a large space while you're wearing a mask, particularly because it muffles your voice. Uh, and so many of our classrooms have extraneous noise as well that we're trying to speak over. So while we have some technology solutions in place and more that we're working on uh, to try to, with the Division of IT, to try to resolve some of that, we also thought it would be a great time to talk about voice from a, a health perspective and how to really care for your voice and how to ensure that the, the instrument that is so vital to your teaching is in the best shape that it can be. We in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning are obviously not experts in this. And so we're delighted that uh, we have an expert for you today. So let me introduce Elizabeth Lanza. She's a speech language pathologist at the University of Utah Voice Disorder Center. She specializes in working with individuals with voice, swallowing and upper airway disorders. Beth holds a master's degree in communication disorders from NIU. So she's an alum, we're glad to have her. And she's received additional training at the Summer Vocology Institute at, with the National Center for Voice and Speech. Prior to entering the world of speech language pathology, Beth worked for nearly 10 years as a professional singer and actor and voice teacher. She is a one-time recipient, three-time nominee for the Chicago Jeff Award Best Actress in a Musical. She earned her undergraduate degrees in vocal performing from Illinois Wesleyan University and remains a proud member of the Actors' Equity Association. Whether on stage or in the clinic, Beth loves all things related to voice. It's my pleasure to introduce Beth. Please go ahead and take over. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, give me one moment as I go through what we are all doing <laughs> these days and sharing my screen with you. Okay. Okay. So hopefully we can see everything. Um, hello from Salt Lake City, Utah. So I'm originally from Wheaton, Illinois and grew up, lived in Chicago land area most of my life. And after graduating from Northern Illinois in 2018, I have been moving all over the place. And I have been here in Salt Lake at the University of Utah Voice Disorder Center for a year right now. So this is a, an image from my hike just last weekend. Um, it's absolutely beautiful here this time of year and I'm grateful to be back home virtually with you right now. Um, so I am a full-time clinician at the U and I have no financial disclosures to present this morning before I begin. Okay, so you all can read, you all understand these learning objectives, so I'm going to let you read this on your own, but ultimately my goal today is to present some basic information about what is vocal hygiene, a little bit more about the voice and why that's important, but my primary goal today is going to give you as many practical, functional, immediate strategies that you can start using today. Um, there's so much demand on you as professors and supervisors right now, and especially in this COVID climate, a lot has to do with the voice. So what is vocal health and why does it matter? So when I refer to vocal health or vocal hygiene, what we're talking about is a, a daily regimen of good habits that you can use every day to maintain optimal function of your vocal folds. It's going to be avoiding certain habits that uh, place unnecessary wear and tear, but I am a firm believer in giving you things to do rather than telling you things not to do. We all know that if you go to a concert, you're going to be hoarse the next day. This is, hopefully we can be a bit more advanced than that today. I want to support you in building positive vocal habits that improve efficient voice use as you continue to work not only through this COVID climate, but ultimately throughout the rest of your careers. So I'm going to use a term a lot today and beat this analogy slightly into the ground. You are a vocal athlete. This is not an original phrase that I came up with, but something well used within the voice world when we're talking about populations that really rely on the voice for their job and demand more of their voice than the typical population. So humor me for a moment. 
Our voice is a muscle or a combination of muscles. We're going to take a look at it in more depth. But consider all that you ask your voice to do, all that you ask those tiny muscles to do during the day. Okay, so you are an athlete. Think about a basketball player or an Olympic runner, right? They are at higher risk for injury because they're placing higher demands on what they're expecting those muscles to do. So an athlete is going to do daily maintenance. An athlete is going to have daily training and coaches and and physical therapists involved in their care. They're going to monitor their use so that they can maintain their function. And if they have an injury, they're going to make appropriate, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're going to make appropriate changes when needed so that they can continue to have their professional career. Why do we not do this with the voice? You are a professional voice user as professors, as clinicians, as teachers, and of all professions, not singers, not vocalists, teachers are the most at risk to develop voice disorders. About a third of teachers have had to reduce their teaching activity due to a voice disorder at some point. And just some really interesting uh, statistics that I found, um, there's over 5 million teachers in the United States and over 2 million of those have reported hoarseness, vocal fatigue or other voice difficulties, okay? So there is a ton of research out there specifically regarding the difficulties with this population, again, outside of COVID times, outside of masks and HEPA filters running. So think about what's demanded of you. You have a higher vocal load. I'm going to refer to this a lot too. Vocal load is how often your voice is turned on during the day, or in other words, how often you're using it during the day. An accountant sitting at a desk going through paperwork, they probably have a low vocal load, but you in lecture all day, thinking about what you do outside of work, it's going to be a lot higher for you. Thinking about the nature of classroom acoustics. I remember being in large lecture, lecture halls at Northern and really small <laughs> carpeted rooms. Thinking about where you are, um, thinking about HVAC noise, um, HEPA filters that are running, the noise of your students, okay? So you have to be talking over all of these things. And then in addition to that, we've got a mask on right now, okay? If your job wasn't stressful enough, let's do all of this during a pandemic. Thinking about the uh, emotional effects that stress can have on the voice as well. So thinking about all of these things in how it's having a daily effect on your voice. So we're going to start today by just spending a short amount of time starting to understand a little bit more about your instrument, a little bit more about the muscles that you use as a vocal athlete. So we're going to start by watching a voice in motion. So this is not a perfect voice. This is called video stroboscopy. And this is um, a system that we use as speech pathologists and laryngologists to examine the vocal folds. It basically um, gives us this slow motion effect of the vocal cords. So this person has some vocal swelling. You can see here on the edges that the edges of their vocal cords or vocal folds, that's an interchangeable term, neither is right or wrong. They have some swelling here. Their vocal folds aren't coming together. But you know what? This is my voice. So you do not have to have a perfect voice to have good vocal hygiene. You do not have to have a perfect voice to last during the day and accomplish what you need to for your teaching load. Okay, so I'm going to simplify this a little bit. We want to think about the voice like an instrument, okay? And thinking about especially a brass instrument, you've got a power source, okay? So if we're looking at Louis Armstrong and his cheeks are puffed up, that's his air. Air is the power source. Our lungs are really the driving force behind our voice. Then we have a vibratory source for a trumpet. That would be the mouthpiece. If I just took a mouthpiece and buzzed into it, it wouldn't make a lot of significant sound. It wouldn't sound like a trumpet. It'd just sound kind of like a, right, a vibratory source. And that's exactly what your vocal folds are or your vocal cords inside your larynx or your voice box, okay? So that's the vibratory source. It doesn't sound like a trumpet until I pop that mouthpiece onto the rest of the instrument. Now I have this collection of tubes and the horn and these resonating chambers that shape that vibratory source that's driven by my airflow to give me that sound that I perceive as a trumpet. And for us, that's what gets perceived as a voice.
so if we break this down a little bit, the evolutionary purpose of a larynx is not voice, okay? So the larynx rests right at the top of the airway. So you've got your lungs, your trachea, and the larynx or voice box rests right here. It's kind of uh, the valving system between the upper airway, or rather the lower airway, the voice box is part of the upper airway and then we have the our throat and everything filters into our oral cavity and our nasal cavity from there okay so primary purpose is to protect the lower airway so it happens to all of us you cough or choke something goes down the wrong pipe if you're not paying attention or laughing when you're eating that's the larynx's response to sensing some kind of infiltrate to its tissues to its muscles to all of the sensory receptors in there and so you cough and cough and cough to try to clear that out so it protects our airway it also is a huge piece of swallowing for some reason, our windpipe and our food pipe are right next to each other, the trachea and the esophagus, okay? So when we swallow, the larynx closes up as a protective mechanism to protect, again, any kind of infiltrate from getting down there. If you're lifting something heavy or having a bowel movement, your vocal folds close together in what's called a valsalva maneuver, which again is another protective way for the uh, larynx to guard the lower airway. So voice is kind of this secondary benefit that we have. And so we want to think about how much we are demanding of that part of our body during the day. So if I'm going back to my analogy of an instrument, right? The power source for our body are the lungs. We talked a little bit about this already. The vibratory source is the vocal folds. And these are extremely delicate tissues that vibrate hundreds of times a second. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that video I showed you of my own voice was vibrating about 230 times a second. Okay, a second. So um, we're asking so much of those tiny little tissues. And then again, here at the level of the vocal folds, that vibratory source gets filtered up the pharynx or the throat and shaped by my tongue, by my lips, by my soft palate, gets shaped into different vowel sounds, which is what you perceive as a voice. Okay, so just a little bit of some fun facts here. For the average cisgendered female, vocal fold length is about the size of a dime. For a cisgendered male, it's about the size of a quarter. So that's tiny, right? Tiny. And the vocal folds are made up of these very, very delicate layers of muscles and tissue. And there's these intracellular levels and fluids in between all of those layers that act as cushions, right? Because every time our vocal folds vibrate, as you saw in that video, that's a collision, okay? So these tissues need to be well-maintained. They need to be well hydrated. If these tissues start to get stiff, it takes a lot more force to bring those vocal cords together. And with a lot more force, that's going to put a lot more um, demand on those tiny tissues, okay? So again, for average cisgender female, that's happening 200 times a second. For average cisgender male, 100 times a second, okay? Um, and I, I was a nerd and did the math about it. So if you are a cisgendered female, you're speaking for an hour in lecture continuously, right? That's approximately 30,000 collisions of those tissues just in that one hour. And again, we're going to be coming back to this idea of vocal load. So what, are, what else are we asking of those tiny tissues during the day? And how is that starting to affect the side effects that we're starting to feel if we're noticing that vocal fatigue? So speaking of vocal fatigue, okay, these are really common signs and symptoms that when I have a patient in with me in my clinic room, these are some of the things that I'm starting to hear from them. It takes me more effort to get my voice out. My voice feels just tired. It feels fatigued. I feel like I can't rely on what's going to come out of my voice. Sometimes it's really clear. Sometimes it's really raspy. Sometimes I get these pitch breaks. Sometimes it's hoarse. I feel like I can't talk as, as high as I used to, or if I want to sing at church or with my kids, I can't go high up in my range. Sometimes it just gives out. I feel like I'm having to clear my throat more. I feel like there's a lump in my throat. Okay, so these are the things that I hear the most that are affiliated with how we're using our voice. So these may be things that you are already experiencing. I'm pretty confident everyone has, ex has experienced some of this in the past. It's very relatable. 
And what I want you to think about is this is more than just about a little bit of a voice change, right? Which is why I start with this idea of you do not have to have a perfect voice to expect excellent function from that part of your body, okay? You don't have to be a singer or an actor to take care of it. But think about how this affects your, your, your students. I think there might be a bar right there. Okay, hopefully you can see that a little bit more. So if you have a voice disorder, right, something that lasts for more than two to three weeks, that's really kind of starting to have an effect on the way that you communicate or the way that you do your job, okay? This has been shown that it may also have a negative impact on your student's ability to process information. It can affect intelligibility just at a plain, simple level. If you're lecturing and that kid in the back can't hear you, Okay? And a dysphonic or a disordered voice is harder for listeners to understand, especially in background noise, than non-disordered speech. I'm not going to get into the acoustics too much of sound, but a clear voice has a clearer acoustic signal. And if I'm talking in a voice that has a little bit of noise behind it, right, you can hear that rasp that starts to come in. That acoustic signal, my the fundamental frequency changes. And the boost that I get from a clear voice that's going to carry over background noise, that's going to be missing if my voice starts to change a little bit, okay? It also can affect, uh, if you have a voice disorder, it may affect your students' motivation and even their executive functioning, their ability to pay attention to you in, in class. So I have my little meme down here, Bueller, Bueller. Thinking about, I mean, he doesn't have a voice disorder, but thinking about how we talk in a lecture, if we are monotone, if we are at a low volume because our voice is starting to feel tired, your kids, your students, they're going to tune out. <laughs> we know how college students are anyways. It's hard enough to keep them engaged. But thinking about how your voice can affect their learning. Hey, this also brings stress to you. If you are in pain or if you have to worry about getting through your lecture, that's going to add stress onto what is already a stressful position. Okay? And what I want to stress is that functional issues can lead to structural damage. So what I mean by this is a lot of us, you know, have this, I see probably about half the patients that I see that sound like this when they come in. They don't have a lump or a bump. They don't have any tissue change, but they are, the way that they are using their voice, the functional component is disordered. And that over time can lead to a structural change, which is a bigger issue. Okay. So you only have one voice. And we all have heard people who, you know, Adele was on the news for a vocal hemorrhage and now she's not performing as much. So all of this, you only get one voice. Okay. So we want to think about how we're maintaining this across the lifespan. So, excuse me, moving on from here, where the rest of the time is going to be thinking about, so what do we do? Okay, so the goal of vocal hygiene is to optimize the correct use of the voice to avoid hyperfunction, to avoid excessive muscular contraction of the laryngeal mechanism. And we're going to talk about that from two approaches, from an indirect approach, thinking about what do I do in my environment right now? Okay, what are some things that I can just change immediately that I do not have to be a voice expert for? And what are some direct things that I can do? Maybe they, these are more massages or um, direct physiological exercises that you can do to manipulate how you're using your actual voice in motion. So let's start with the indirect approach, coming back to our vocal load and thinking about a vocal budget. Oh my goodness, how embarrassing. Okay. Sorry, I thought I silenced everything. So you only have so much to spend with your voice during the day, okay? Think about if you have $10, okay? If you are teaching four lectures, okay, that is maybe 60% of what you have to spend. You only have 40% less. So what are you doing? Are you singing in the car on the way home? Are you coaching your kids' soccer teams? Are you going out to dinner afterwards? Are you engaging with your family? No, no, this is bad. But all of a sudden, all of these things, if we go past our budget, we're on credit. You understand this analogy. So we're now using things that we, we have to start pushing our system. And so it's not that any of these things are bad, but we do have to think as a professional voice user about a balance, okay? So I'm not asking anyone to ever, you know, go home and not talk to your family, but thinking very intentionally as that athlete about how you use those muscles during the day. So we're gonna be talking about how you can create a vocal schedule 
thinking about some ways you can warm up your voice for the day, adjusting your volume. Tracy and Stephanie get huge points already because I saw a USB headset on them for this virtual experience. And thinking about, you know, when you are lecturing, whether it's in clinic or uh, in clinic, whether it's in real life in the lecture hall or whether it's virtually, are you talking at a volume like this all of the time? Because if you're talking at that increased volume, your vocal folds, that amplitude, that force is going to increase and that's going to be a much quicker road to fatigue, to swelling, to discomfort, okay? So thinking about how can I just adjust my volume? When I started doing more virtual work, my voice was exhausted. I am an extrovert. And in this virtual world, I'm trying to connect with my patients in a way where I don't have that energy anymore face to face. So I found myself really pushing, really trying to engage them vocally because my brain had this disconnect. Okay, I'm a foot and a half away from my computer. They're a foot a half and away from their computer. Let me make up for it. And I was exhausted. But if I can talk at more of a conversational level, conversational level and let my headset mic or let my personal amplification system do the work for me, then I can last a lot longer. And that's that idea of efficiency. Um, using nonverbal cues if you are in the lecture hall, turning on and off the lights, clapping your hands. You know, you're working with adults, even though it may not seem like it sometimes. So expressing to them, hi, my voice is tired. So I'm going to be trying some new things with you so I can last longer. When you see me do this, here's what I expect of you. Put that back on your students. If you are going to your kid's basketball game at night, can you clap your hands? Can you whistle? Can you do something else that's not shouting out at them? Again, to cut down on that vocal load. If you're starting to feel vocal fatigue or changes in your voice, I want you to find times of your day to implement vocal naps. This is a time where your voice is turned off. Not whispering, not talking quietly, turned off. That p image in the video that I showed you earlier, when your voice is turned on, when you're talking, when any sound is coming out, your vocal folds are vibrating. When you're just breathing, they're just hanging out like this. So short vocal naps, even if this is for 10 or 20 minutes during your day, can allow time for some natural swelling that does occur with voice use to start to quell a little bit. So thinking about how can I find these times of day? And if you are a chatter, if you are an outgoing person, this may be really difficult for you to do. I encourage people, be a realist, you know, set an alarm on your phone that just says, be quiet. <laughs> Find sometimes, maybe it's during your office hours, where you can just turn off before you go home. Okay. So thinking about some basic care and maintenance, I am sure you have heard this before. One of the best things that you can do for your voice is stay well hydrated. Okay, those tiny, tiny layers of cells and tissues that collide thousands of times a day, they need to be well cushioned, and that's done through hydration. So we can have intrinsic hydration, okay, which is drinking water during the day, and you can have extrinsic extrinsic hydration. So I live in Salt Lake. It's really, really dry here. I know what it's like in Chicago as soon as the heaters turn on. The air quality just changes. So having a humidifier in your room, maybe when you sleep at night, maybe having a personal one that you bring into your lecture hall if you find that helps you. A personal steamer or nebulizer. Uh, nebulizing saline, if, if you'd like, I can give you more information about that. There's been a lot of research that's come out of that recently. Um, steam uh, hydration cells are too big to be instantly absorbed by the vocal folds, but nebulizing with isotonic saline has been shown to have um, the, the nebulizer breaks the water part particles down even smaller for better absorption by the mucosa in the larynx and pharynx. And so what that can do is it can pull back when they're hydrated about the amount of force that you need to get the vocal folds started. Because if they're dry, if they're stiff, you need more from that power source. You need more from the lungs to get those tissues going. Okay. Whatever you breathe in directly touches your vocal folds. So thinking about how do you relax? What kinds of things are legal now in Illinois? We don't know enough about that with marijuana, we do know a ton of research that we know tobacco smoke is bad for you. So just thinking about whether it's secondhand smoke or um, anything else that you might be around or vaping, we still don't have enough research, but we can presume 
that even vaping or marijuana is going to have a detrimental effect to those very delicate tissues, especially as a vocal athlete. I'm never going to take a cup of coffee away from someone or a nightcap, okay? But monitoring how much alcohol or coffee you have in your system or caffeine in general, especially in comparison to good old water. Okay, there is water in coffee, there is water in tea. It's not that that can't hydrate your whole body, but as that athlete, you need even more hydration. Okay, so thinking about that balance of every cup of coffee I have, I'm gonna add a glass of water just to make sure I'm not drying myself out. Okay, allergies can create irritation. Okay, and irritation, post nasal drip, increased coughing, throat clearing, that can start to make our vocal folds kind of swollen, anyways. So, if we are kind of compromised at the start, whether it has to do with acid reflux or allergies or a medication that we're on that might have a drying component to our vocal folds, again, being even more cognizant about our level of hydration to kind of counteract those changes from the medication that you're on, for example. Sleep. Ha <laughs> ha. If you aren't a great sleeper, thinking about at night, that's your body's time to heal. Okay. And so if we're not getting enough sleep, then you're probably going to feel low energy in the morning. And again, when we're low energy, everything is just kind of harder. You can hear how my voice changes. I don't have that power source. I'm not, I, you know, I, I need more brain power to focus on what I'm doing rather than kind of being able to multitask and think about finding my optimal voice um, and stress. Okay. Fight or flight mechanism. We are built that when we are stressed out, we go to an, to a tense posture. And we're going to talk about how the larynx hangs in a sling of muscles. So if we're already stressed, okay, how does that transfer here? How does that affect our, our power source, our breath? Are you breathing? I mean, obviously you're breathing, but are you breathing cyclically in a low, easy, open way? Or do you breathe in high and tight and kind of hold it? We're all guilty of that sometimes, but these are all things that we can start to kind of just notice. Hey, I know that this has been something that's a source of discussion at Northern Illinois. And um, I heard from Stephanie that working to get um, amplification into classrooms across the board is something that's in process. I know it's not a perfect system. I cannot encourage you enough to spend $40 and buy yourself one as you wait for your amplification system to be put in by Northern. Um, do not try to compete with background noise. Again, the louder you have to talk, the greater that force, the greater the strain, and it's just this vis vicious cycle, okay? So thinking about personal amplification systems, there are tons of them out there. You can spend anything from 30 bucks to 300 bucks on it, okay? So anything that you could do would be optimal. The key is, to dummy proof it for yourself. That's how I explain it to my patients. When I have a microphone right here, I can see it out of the corner of my eye. That is a direct reminder to me that I do not need to push. This is gonna do the work for me. And thinking about if you're in a room that's carpeted, okay, that's gonna be different with how your sound travels versus if you're in a room with tile, okay? And how's that sound gonna reverberate differently? And again, thinking about what other background noises you have. If you're teaching virtually still, are you speaking out into a whole big room? Play with your system. Maybe you can sound strange, but turn your desk so that you're closer up to the wall behind you so you can get a little bit of gain, a little bit of feedback. But I really encourage that personal amplification system and the USB mic if you're working virtually um, and just finding that for you and seeing how that affects your efficiency during the day. There's this awesome thing that I found since uh, the pandemic started and I put a link on here. This voicebooster.com has a ton of um, products out there that you that are very affordable that you can look into on your own. But for $4, they make a mask that has a built-in pocket for that microphone or built-in extra space for that microphone for professors, for teachers who have to use this during the day. So that's a $4, great thing to look into. Hey, here's my setup. So um, earlier in the pandemic, I was doing much more virtual therapy just as last year, I know you were all teaching online. And I would say I'm 
80% back in the clinic right now. But when I work from home, this is what my setup looks like. So just a couple of things to draw your attention to. Um, I have my computer stacked on a bunch of books from grad school at Northern. Okay, I'm bringing that up to me because I want to think about my posture when I'm speaking. Maybe it's when I'm in real life, but also if I am craning right to into my screen or if it's not at eye level with me, what do I have to do? I have to elevate my chin, okay? And if I'm doing that, then all these muscles in the neck are engaged and they're gonna pull on that voice box. And again, I'm at increased strain already. I've got my water bottle with me. I often have my coffee with me. Again, not saying you can't do that, but balance. And then I also have my nerdy straw with me, which we will talk about in a little bit. Hey, what if you're sick, okay? Um, this is really hard because as professors, it's not easy to take a day off. If you only get to lecture once a week for three hours and you cancel a lecture, that's a huge deal. I understand, okay? But thinking about when you are sick, there may actually be structural changes that are happening. I want to bring your attention to, these are all laryngees. These are all pictures of vocal folds. This is a picture of laryngitis, okay? Laryngitis, that itis is a true blue swelling of the vocal folds. Okay, you can see this increased redness and hypervascularity. This person has some, almost some thickening of mucosa on the vocal folds. So if we're thinking about those delicate tissues and the, the threshold pressure that it takes to get that airflow going from your power source to get the vocal folds going, this person is gonna need a ton more air and those vocal cords are gonna be stiff, okay? Not even just mimicking this. You may not even be capable of changing the sound of your voice if your vocal folds are angry and stiff like this. And the reason I've included some of these other pictures are not for scare tactics, but you are more prone to injury if you are sick, okay? So all these blood vessels, we all have them. And just because you have a blood vessel in your voice box that's prominent doesn't mean you're going to hemorrhage, but it can. And a hemorrhage may, is often felt as like an acute or immediate voice change or loss, okay? And if you push through on something like this, you're at risk for scarring those tissues, and that is a permanent change. These lumps and bumps up here, this is a kind of an increased version of, um, of, of mid-membranous swelling. This is what I see in teachers very commonly. This is kind of that impact zone that takes the most force. And this is an example of a structural change that's happened. This is a polyp. This is something that can be come over time or can be kind of an immediate injury if we keep pushing <sighs> through. So listen, oh, someone just throat cleared real good and we're gonna talk about that next, haha. -ha. Um, so thinking about when you are sick, rely on every strategy that you can. Okay, if you don't feel comfortable using the personal amplification system all the time, then pull it out when you really need it. Make sure you're talking at a conversational level or a confidential voice level, as if you're talking to someone at a restaurant pre-COVID times and you don't want the table next to you to hear what you're saying, but you need that person next to you to still hear you. So it's not whispering, whispering. I'm not gonna recommend whispering. Whispering has been shown not to affect the vocal folds directly, but we're at higher risk for straining the extra laryngeal muscles here. And sometimes that's an even harder habit to break than fixing something like this little swelling that's at the top center of your screen. If you have completely lost your voice, okay, if you've completely lost your voice, do not take steroids from your primary care doctor. Take, you only want to take steroids if you have seen a, a physician who specializes in the voice who has actually taken a look at your vocal folds, okay? Steroids are going to make you feel great in the moment if you have this edema or this swelling in your vocal cords, but you're still pushing through on an injury. So you're even more at risk to injure yourself without even knowing. Okay, so what if you are the person where, gosh, at the end of the day, I am just sore, okay? So in this image, I just want to point out all of the complex musculature that's in the cervical area, okay? So the larynx is right here, and it's hidden under all these layers, and it makes me want to sing that song about how everything is connected to everything else, okay? Everything from floor of mouth musculature to our chin and our jaw and these strap muscles on the side of our neck, which I guarantee from all of us who are teaching or at computers, 
we have that tension anyways, okay? But even this can affect your voice. So here's a few of my favorite stretches that you can do, okay? And some pictures to kind of talk you through these things. As you're doing these stretches, um, you wanna make sure that you're keeping a relaxed jaw and a relaxed tongue. People never think about the tongue as holding tension, but I find for teachers and professional voice users, the tongue carries a great deal of tension that affects the entire rest of the system, okay? So you wanna kinda of keep, I call it Novocaine jaw or Novocaine mouth. Kinda of like you have a golf ball or a blueberry, something on the inside of your mouth, keeping space between your back molars, and that tongue is just kinda of bleh, fat and flat, resting either on the floor of the mouth or kind of just resting gently against that top teeth, okay? So thinking about our strap musculature and stretching um, our sternocleidomastoid, this big giant ropey muscle, and keeping your ear to one side, and feel for easy, low abdominal breathing. I don't use the term diaphragm breathing, breathe from the diaphragm. We always breathe with our diaphragm or we would have much bigger problems. But if I'm breathing high and tight like this, I'm using all of the muscles that are already tight. So I wanna breathe low in my body, feel movement in my rib cage or my abdomen. And so starting with this kind of stretch to the ear to the shoulder, and then looking at the second and third picture, starting to stretch some of the scalene muscles, which are some of the surrounding strap muscles there in anterior and posterior. You can make adjustments to this as you go. One of my favorites, we have this huge sheath of muscle all around our neck um, and our base of tongue and our jaw muscles can all get connected up here. So taking your own hand and gently placing it on your own skin, taking your opposite hand, gently pulling down to, towards your belly button and gently lifting your chin to the ceiling, feeling that stretch in the front. Do not stop breathing while you're doing this. Nine out of 10 people that do this in the clinic, all of a sudden, stop breathing. Breathe through it. Be very intentional. Keep your jaw released. Keep your tongue released. Happy to spend more time on this with questions later. I'm going to keep moving. This image down here, bottom left, we're massaging the base of tongue. Okay? So this gets really tight. Okay? I'm talking like this on purpose because I'm trying to keep that Novocaine feeling in my mouth. I'm taking my thumb and I'm gently rubbing that squishy part <laughs> behind my jawbone like I'm making thumbprint cookies. Okay? For me, where I'm exhausted at the end of the day is back here. Okay, so these are called the suprahyoid muscles. And the hyoid bone is the bone that your larynx hangs from, okay? So that hyoid bone just kind of floats there. So if everything around here is tight, it's gonna be in this elevated position. So starting with your thumbs kind of right under that squishy part and moving them back kind of up and under your jawbone towards your ears. Notice, I don't know if you can see me, hopefully you can still see me. I am not sticking my chin out. My jaw is parallel with the floor. I have space between my back molars. My tongue is fat and flat on the floor of my mouth and I'm breathing. If you are a person who has TMJ, okay, massaging your jaw, kind of releasing in here to get everything nice and loose and open. Sorry to shame whoever throat cleared loudly. But increased throat clearing can also be a sign of a voice disorder or uh, go hand in hand with vocal fatigue, okay? So when we clear our voice, we clear our voice when we feel something in there or we hear ourselves getting scratchy. <clears throat> so let me see if I can clear that out. But clearing your throat is really just slamming your vocal folds together unnecessarily. And it, just what I just demonstrated, clapping my hands. If you're at a concert and you're clapping over and over and over again, your hands are gonna get red, gonna get tingly. Increased throat clearing will do that to you. So if you are a person who clears your throat a lot, we gotta start thinking about that. Take a sip of water and swallow hard instead, or give a silent throat clear, okay? If instead of, <clears throat> if I go, <clears throat> that is the exact same mechanism, that's the exact same movement. And if I legitimately have phlegm, Okay, that'll move the phlegm off of my vocal folds. But unless I take a sip of water and swallow, that phlegm is just gonna stay right there and bounce back and forth on those vocal folds like a beach ball at a concert. So after everything you do to try to clear that sensation or that phlegm, swallow it, okay? And just because you feel mucus doesn't mean there's something there. 
okay? If I talk in a voice that's kind of stuck in my throat all day, every day, and I feel vibratory sensation down here, <clears throat> I'm going to start to have increased sensory awareness down here. That's going to get really irritating, and I'm going to start clearing more and more. Versus if I'm talking in a place that's more up at my mouth, I'll come back and talk about this. If you feel post-nasal drip, add in a saline rinse, okay? Chew gums, pop some gum in your mouth, or suck on sugar-free candy if you have dry mouth to keep yourself swallowing. For teachers, this is one of my favorite things that I've come across uh, that's new to me. Um, this is called a xylomelt. I see some chat right now, um, so I will come back to that because I can't read them right now, but I'm definitely making sure we have time for questions. A xylomelt um, is for dry mouth, and instead of having gum or something in your mouth that's kind of like floating around because that's hard to do when you're talking or lecturing, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to throw clear and practice what I preach. Okay, so I'm going to take that xylomelt and stick it on my back molar and hold it for about 20 or 30 seconds and let it adhere to my tooth. Then it's going to stay there and help release some... Um, I don't really know. It's, it's, xylitol is the chemical that kind of helps increase uh, saliva and keeps us swallowing, okay? So from this slide, just because you feel mucus there doesn't mean it's really there. Give it one cough. Give it one throat clear. <clears throat> something lighter, something gentle. Swallow it down and then think about, okay, what else can I just adjust? Have your family keep an ear out for you. I, I am kind of a jerk to my patients who have chronic throat clearing and coughing. Most of the time we're not even aware of it and I will legitimately make them keep a tally just to bring their awareness to it. This is a habit that a lot of people have with vocal fatigue that they don't even know about. Okay, so some that's more of my kind of indirect approach. And I'm just going to give you a couple of direct approaches, a couple of really quick things. If you have five minutes or less, what can you do for your voice that actually helps the vocal fold tissues, okay? So these are called semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. From a speech pathologist who might be on here, this is Dr. Ingo Tietze. Uh, he is kind of the, gr the grandfather of... Um, of vocology, which is the science of voice. He's actually a physicist, but has done a ton of work um, in the voice world to improve vocal care. He's done a ton of research, especially for teachers and professional voice users. So when we narrow one part of the vocal tract, okay, what we can do is we're changing the pressures inside the vocal tract. And long story short, it helps optimize the way the aerodynamic energy from our air, from the power source, gets transferred transferred into acoustic energy, okay, which becomes our voice that gets shaped and travels up and out into the world. Those vocal cords, when they're healthy, are coming together and touching in this kind of way like this. It's a 3D model. And just the edges, that's just the edges we want them to touch. But the louder I talk or the more press that I talk, the more mass I'm using, the more squeeze I'm giving. And it can lead to this really pressed vocal quality. And that can become, again, hoarse or tired as you talk. So doing some semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, SOVTs, can help us find vocal efficiency. It can help us coordinate our airflow, our optimal vibration, and our resonance with our vocal tract, again, the way that the sound gets filtered up out into the world, uh, helps us see and feel it, and helps us kind of back off. I have a video that I made of myself on YouTube doing this that you can go and, and have a little bit more information about it um, and practice along with that. If you have five minutes, okay, and I'm going to play this video at the same time and talk over it. If you only have five minutes, and you are starting to feel tired in between lectures, get out a straw. Okay, so what you're going to be doing is holding that straw into about an inch of water and reverting to childhood. You're going to be blowing bubbles at the same time as making sound. And what I want you to think about is, you know, this concept of vocal warm-up, who thinks about that as a speaker? We, we hear singers talking about it, but you need to warm up the range that you're going to be using when you speak, okay? So spend a lot of time just in one comfy note like I'm doing in this video, okay? After that, start to make some really gentle pitch glides, okay? And then you can start to increase your range going up a little bit higher and then a little bit lower. 
you know you're doing it right if it feels easy in your throat. You should feel some buzzing at the lips, which is that resonance component. That's some like immediate kinesthetic feedback that your voice is optimized here at the mouth. We do not want it in our throat. If your bubbles are stopping and starting or inconsistent, it means that your power source isn't working, okay? So if you only have five minutes, I think there's benefit in stretching whatever feels sore, connecting with your breath, releasing anything that's gotten tight after that amount of teaching, and get out that straw, okay? And just work through that. Uh, I, one of the big gurus in our field talks about when we're doing a straw, or we're doing something that facilitates resonance in our voice. She compares it to like, it's like dropping medicine directly onto the vocal cords. There is research out there that shows that semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, resonant voice exercises, again, anything that helps facilitate that oral or nasal vibratory feedback, can actually help reduce vocal fold swelling even with use because we're unpressing and we're facilitating some healing enzymes. Okay, so speaking of resonant voice, the last thing that I want to it challenge you to think about uh, before we switch over for questions is where do you talk during the day? Okay, so a lot of people who come to me in clinic, I have them say, okay, count from one to 10. And I hear one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, cool. Tell, tell me where you feel that voice. Most of the people point right to their throat. Okay, so thinking about, and you can do this on your own at home, just give me a gentle hum. Hmm. Hmm, and see if you can feel for any vibration in your lips, in your teeth, in your tongue, in your nose, in your cheekbones. Hmm, hmm, and if you're not feeling any of it, put a little bit of breath behind it like you're sighing at the end of a long day. Hmm, hmm, good, I hear a couple of people trying it. Or thinking about um, a zzz, a Z sound, like a buzzy mosquito. Zzz, I feel air over my lips and my teeth, okay? And so what we want to do is find that resonant voice. Um, there's a quote that I really, really like that I wanted to share with you. Um, a resonant voice is described as the pattern of voice use where oral vibratory sensations are used during ear easy voicing. The primary goal of resonant voice is to achieve a balanced oral nasal resonance in an easy fashion to ultimately address a, a, a individual's voice complaints, okay? So I can go from saying, mm, I can hum and it can still be in my throat. Mm, 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 mm. Now, as you're listening to this, you might say, well, she's just doing it in a higher voice. I'm really not but my acoustic signal is more clear. So your ear is gonna perceive it as a higher pitch, okay? Mm, Monday, mm, me, 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 versus mm, me, 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 me. Monday, mm-hmm, mm, ooh, I look like a crazy person. But I want you to play with where do you talk as you lecture? Are you talking up here or are you talking down here? One of the easiest ways, especially underneath a mask, that you can bring your voice more forward is to focus on using crisp, clear consonants, okay? So thinking about instead of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that's not bad, I'm not, I'm not super hoarse, I'm not strained. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Hopefully you can hear a change in my voice when I do that, okay? I'm using, when I think about really using crisp, clear articulation, I'm automatically using more breath energy. I'm automatically thinking about my lips and my teeth and my tongue, which is going to promote that optimal resonance. So without going to a voice therapist for goodness gracious, how long, that's something that you can try right off the bat and start noticing in your lectures, are you starting to get to a place where you kind of mumble? Or can you keep it crisp and clear and start to think about that articulatory precision? Do you talk in a monotone voice? Are you Bueller, Bueller, Bueller? Or do you have prosody or intonation? Because when we do this and we vary our pitch, we stay out of the basement. There's nothing wrong with talking in a low voice and there's nothing wrong if you're not a very vocally dynamic person. But there is if you're starting to feel fatigued because talking down there in one spot is not efficient. 
and also thinking about your breath. Pause for breath. If there's punctuation, take a breath because a voice that goes out on the breath is also going to be more efficient because it's fueled from that power source. Sorry, there is a drill outside that is loud even with the doors closed. Um, Anyways, but talking on a voice that has that airflow behind it is going to be much more efficient. If I don't have good airflow, then all of these extra laryngeal muscles are going to have to overcompensate, and now I'm going to be at that risk for vocal fatigue. Okay, so in conclusion, be proactive. Start noticing what are your patterns. Are you talking every day, all day? Do you call a friend on I-88 on the way home, right? Do I have vocal naps? Am I allowing my vocal folds to heal? Am I efficient or am I talking down here and just kind of pressing through and trying to increase my volume and just feeling exhausted? Use those indirect and direct strategies. Play with things. It's not going to feel natural at first because think about how many years you've been using your voice. But it is an issue now as we're in this new world and we have to just combat against all of these extra forces against us that challenge our sound. Don't wait until it's a problem. Okay, you need your voice for your whole career to teach your students. So start these things now. And finally, if you notice problems that persist longer than two weeks and you're not sick, go see an ear, nose and throat doctor or a laryngologist or speech language pathologist that uses a video stroboscopy. Okay, that's that image that I showed you earlier that shows true blue movement of the vocal cords. Just a quick peek at the vocal cords doesn't really assess function. So call your doctor and say, hey, I need a strobe. Who does this for me? and go and find out about that. Uh, there is a resource on here um, called the Voice Academy, and it's through the University of Iowa. It is one of my favorite websites, and I would highly encourage you to go online and look at it. It is, it is for teachers. It is this phenomenal resource. It's got long lists of medications to think about if, um, if you're experiencing dryness. It's a lot of science on there, a lot of links to um, suggestions of additional things you can try. Call your wonderful speech pathology team right at Northern, okay? I am always a resource. You are welcome to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions that I have. Um, but you've got some wonderful resources right there at NIU that can help you out. So I am going to pause here and, oops, and leave the rest of the time. I've got eight minutes for questions. Um, and I'm going to try to look at the chat right now to see if there is anything in here. So can I say more about how to protect the voice while wearing a mask? Yes. Don't try to fight the mask. Okay. We are literally, you, you have a, a dampening force over your acoustic signal right now. You can't compete with that. So put that microphone underneath the mask, okay? And or think about crisp, clear speech because that's going to produce that higher acoustic energy that can help cut through because if I'm talking like this through a mask, no way am I going to get through it. So that crisp, clear speech can be really, really helpful. Pausing for more breath and making sure that you're not just trying to push through it. Volume is not the answer when it comes to vocal fatigue. Um, any suggestions to manage a break in the vocal range? Your straw. Yes, this can be a wonderful thing. So a, a break can happen for lots of different reasons. It can mean that there's just kind of an acoustic shift. It can be a sign of tension in the voice. And, uh, and or it could be a sign that there's a little swelling right there. And again, just because you have swelling does not mean it's the end of the world. So sometimes if I am tired at the end of the day and I'm going through my straw, which by the way, you don't have to do with water, and there's nothing magic about this straw. I keep a regular old drinking straw cut in half, and I keep it in my car, and I do it on the way to work, and I do it on the way home from work with the exact slide breakdown that I put in this PowerPoint. People think I'm smoking something strange at red lights, but that's a really helpful way for me to kind of navigate through my whole range. If you hear a pitch glide or a pitch break, focus on the bubbles. Don't try to push harder or louder. Just kind of work through it and say, okay, is my airflow consistent? Is that buzz consistent or is it starting to kind of like break? And just gently work through it. If you're worried about it, go get scoped, right? Go get a strobe and see, oh yeah, I do have a little swelling right there. Because maybe that's that point when the vocal folds are stretching out where they're not coming together quite as much. And that can cause a voice break too. 
Being a low talker. Yeah. So thinking about, you know, again, you can just be this person who kind of talks in this low range and that's your habit. That's your personality. I don't, ex I don't expect you to talk like this. That you're students will be disinterested for other reasons. Okay, but thinking about how can I add pitch variability, and you may have to be very intentional with it, and you might need an accountability partner, but record yourself on your phone just kind of practicing reading through one of your lectures, and just listen back to yourself, and listen, what, what, what do I sound like? Okay, you can, again, talk low in your range and not have it be a problem if there's still sufficient airflow and resonance if you're talking back here, eh, then it's it's a little bit harder. Um, say more about a saline rinse. Yes, absolutely. Um, so a saline rinse, especially if you have allergies or irritants or post-nasal drip, okay, uh, all of that, again, is connected. So things can drip down that posterior pharyngeal wall and kind of irritate the vocal cords. So um, out there, I'd say there's three things out there that people use. A neti pot, which I actually don't recommend. Uh, there's been some research that a neti pot actually strips too much. My favorite is the Neil Med sinus rinse. You can get it at Walmart, Target, wherever, okay? And it's just, um, I used mine yesterday actually because I was starting to feel really, really dry. So it's just some distilled water with saline in it and, and you squirt it over a sink and it kind of just helps clear out those nasal passages if that freaks you out. Three bucks at Walmart, you can get just a, a saline rinse um, that's more of a spray bottle and that's not going to be as effective, but it can help keep you hydrated, especially if you're feeling like you've just got dry, crusty things in here, which again can sometimes make you feel uh, a little bit irritated back in here as well. Any advice for how to encourage students to speak more audibly with their masks on? Yeah, encourage them to use that kind of crisp, clear articulation or model for them. Kind of imitate them back. Be like, I'm so sorry, here's what I heard from you. Okay, I can't, can you think about just giving me a little bit more volume or a little bit more change in the variability of, of your pitch? Because that's going to carry a lot more than this is down here. Uh, the xylitol lozenge, would the xylitol lozenge help for losing my voice? I think it depends why you're losing your voice. The xylitol lozenge will help with dryness and it will keep you swallowing during the day. Post nasal drip, as gross as it is, we do want to swallow flush it out or swallow it, okay? And I think what a lot of us do with post-nasal drip <clears throat> <clears throat> is we just kind of keep clearing it out. And again, if you keep clearing and you start irritating, then your brain starts to interpret swelling and irritation as mucus because we're, we're not that smart, right? So we start interpreting, or interpreting irritability as something there and then you're clearing your voice even more. Oh, great question, Vicky. Using throat coat comfort tea. I, I forgot to mention this. Throat coat, voodoo potions. I make garlic and boil an onion and that solves my voice. This is, this is not real, okay? So um, anything that you drink does not touch your vocal cords. If you did, we would have a much different lecture and you would have a significant swallowing problem. Your vocal cords close and that whole area is protected every time you swallow. So throat coat or, or you know, drinking apple cider vinegar, not a big fan of that, okay? Um, that touches your, your pharyngeal, your throat tissue, okay? But it's not actually going to affect your voice. So if it makes you feel better, do it go for it. And it might make your throat feel better, like the, the mucosa of the throat, but know that on a scientific level, it's not directly, directly affecting your vocal cords at all. At I got all. a quick question. I'm going to jump in. Is yeah, okay? Natalie, go ahead. Right. Um, so I do have a deeper, more distinctive voice, um, and I have had surgery because of the constant touching where you had to remove polyps, and I couldn't talk for two weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had to, I said, well, let me jump in. I want to know when I, because most of my classes are three hours long, you know, and that's definitely like good, but touching my throat does help. And I, and I do find myself doing that. Good. Um, but when is the, I know you said, do you kind of answered my question? You said you do it on your way to work and on your way home from work. How long are we to do like these um, vocal with the bubbles? 
three to five minutes is good. Uh -huh. Anything you can do. The other thing too, Natalie, if you've got a three hour long lecture, I would be exhausted too. Okay. Think about, can I build in any, and maybe you're already doing this. Can I build in any partner activities for my students so that I have 10, 15 minutes where they're working individually on something and I'm going to take a vocal nap. I'm going to turn my voice off for those 10 minutes and I'm going to sit there and sneak this under my mask and unpress my voice. Do this during the middle of a lecture. Um, you, you, you cannot do this enough. Okay. You can do this as much as you want. That's a great question. Okay. And the other thing too, Natalie, again, three hours for anybody is going to be exhausting. Okay. So keep an ear out for that, um, the vocal volume that you're using, because you might be able, if you can get an, a microphone, talking here uh, might last you longer before you start to feel tired, but you're going to yeah. feel, you're going to feel pooped afterwards and it might not be a sign you're doing anything wrong. That's just really hard. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I want to jump in because it is the the end of the hour. I want to thank Beth. Everyone, please join me in, in thanking her. I think this was fantastic. So much great advice. Thank you. Uh, for everyone who uh, I think was interested in personal voice amplifiers, I want to let you know that NIU does have some available. Feel free to purchase your own, but if you don't want to, we have them. Uh, you request them through the Division of IT. I put the link in the chat. I'll do it one more time. Uh, those are yours. They don't stay with your classroom, so you can use them in multiple rooms. You could use them in meetings, wherever you're going. It would be yours to use. And when you're done, you turn it back into the service desk. Uh, but there's plenty of those right now available for those of you who are attending this session. Um, again, this recording will be made available. Uh, Beth, hopefully we can share the slides as well. Um, yep, sounds great. Uh, and we look forward to, to working with you all going forward. And, and again, just a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Beth. This was great. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, Beth. You're awesome. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Morris. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> So Stephanie, 